Tana, did you hear about the new Paisano's deal? More pizza, less dough. Medium, one topping, $5.99. Are you out of your mind? I'm going to order it right now, buddy. What's the code? Yes, $5.99 pizza. Hurry up, man. Press in. I'm hungry. I'm on it, buddy. I'm yes. It's the same sale of my show. Home of Blue Ball Blue. Number 89. I'm the time. Travis on the right. Hot mic on the left. Every single week is a lyric uh, 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 Santana Moss Show. What's up, Papi? What's up, my brother? I'm good, man. Uh, Travis Thomas, Santana Moss. This is the post-draft edition. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to throw you for a loop, though. You're about to get mad at me. Just be prepared. Don't do it. I'm scrapping the whole show we had planned. We were going to get into the Redskins draft and everyone else, every other player that went to every team. You can get that anywhere. You can break that down anywhere. I want to actually, because talking to you before the show off camera, man, you were dropping some dimes about the behind the scenes aspect of an NFL draft. And I jotted this down, Tana. This is where I'm throwing you for a loop. You gave me three things, really, in talking to me that I wrote down. I called the three pillars mm. of the NFL draft. Tana talked about the draft from his perspective as a player. That's a pillar. But then Tana told an interesting story about how a team, for lack of a better word, sabotaged you uh, to hoping you would fall to them. So that's another pillar, the team aspect. And then you talked about Drew Rosenhaus and how some guys didn't have agents and didn't get a shot. So I thought, oh, well, the draft also you could look at from an agent perspective. Yeah. So we're going to go with that if you're cool with it, the three pillars of the draft. Because yeah, to me, this is the kind of stuff that makes your show so unique, is that you can tell these stories from your perspective. Okay? So I want to start with the player perspective. When you were getting drafted, you were told leading up all week, all subsequent months really leading up to the draft, Two teams were interested in you, the Redskins, and was it the Dolphins? Well, honestly, I was I knew for a fact it was the Redskins. You knew the Redskins at 15? Yes. Being that I was a Miami guy from the University of Miami, uh, for some odd reason, the Dolphins was always in that um, that area of they, you know, fans saying if you don't pick from home, if you right. don't get a guy, if you don't get a hurricane, you're not giving yourself a chance to win. So they had to look in. So you were on their radar from that. I was on their radar just because of, you know, before then they picked the receiver that went to them. And I'm just to be honest to you. Yeah. um, I mean, with you, I didn't want to go to the Dolphins for a lot of reasons. But why? One, I didn't want to be home. I've been home all my life. You know, I wanted to get away. I wanted to finally say, okay, I can leave the coop. You know what I mean? I can finally be that pigeon and, and find my way out. Two, uh, it was a serial pick before from the Dolphins that panned out well on the cottage level at University of Miami that went and blew his knee. Mm. And I was like, I don't want to be second to him going to the Dolphins and, you know, catching that bad luck and, you know, having something like that happen to me. It's crazy that I ended up hurting my knee that first year anyway, regardless going to the right. Jets. But, yeah, so the whole time leading up to the draft, I talked to straight Washington folks. It was it was odd because like I told you before, I'm so superstitious with yeah. how I do things. I never wanted to let that thing sit and say, Well, this is where I'm going. Everyone's saying I'm going here. I heard so much from my agent, from guys before me, like, man, it's so much goes on. Draft day itself, if someone doesn't get picked in the slot, teams change their format or change who they have in those slots and go out to other guys. So um, I never let it sink in and say that, that. That it was a done deal. I never let it be saying that, hey, I'm going to put all my marbles in this one basket, that, hey, let's get ready and get prepared to be, you know, Washingtonians. Okay, so hold on a second. Now, to be fair, in your year, I'm holding the draft order here. Yep. The Skins pick 15th. Mm-hmm. Um, you ended up going 16 to the Jets. The Dolphins at that time picked at 26. Yeah. So you would either have to drop or – which was more than likely they would have to move up to come get you. Yeah. But you had been hearing skin, skin, skins. skins all, the whole week, man. I mean, I was. I remember I was at track meets. I was at the local high school track meets just sitting watching, you know, the regionals and, uh, you know, get ready for the states because I was so in tune in everything that was going on down in Miami. Like I said, I hadn't left. Right. So everything that I did, you know, prior to being a, a collegiate, 
I was always participating in all those same activities that led me to my college years, whether it was football games, during the football season, and then in the off season, track meets. You know, I was still in tune with both of those because I did, I participated in both in college. And we have some of the fastest, some of the best football and track athletes down there. So I've always made sure I found my way to Trash Pile Stadium and, you know, checking out the latest, you know, talent that's going to be leaving high school. And I remember being at those high school track meets at the time, and it was numerous calls coming in from Washington. You know, hey, want to have an interview with you because, you know, you know, it's four days left. Wow. Five days it's left. It's like a countdown. You name it. They count down how we count down, you know, how we count down a week ago, and they telling us, like, well, hey, everyone has, you know, that Redskins, Dan Snyder's very high on you, and they want, you know, that Miami talent. What do you feel about it? And I remember those conversations, man, vividly. And I remember sitting there saying, well – Man, it's great just to be able to be in the situation I am now today because I recall being that guy from high school that didn't even know I was going to get a chance to play on a sure. college level. You know, the way I got myself in the door of walking on through a track scholarship, not having those elite schools to want to take a chance after me. Had a few, but not the ones that you would want, to, you know, want especially from my hometown or my home state. And now to be sitting in the seat where – I didn't have to do a senior bowl. I didn't have to do all this stuff. I didn't have to perform at, you know, the combine. I did it at my own pro day. And now to be sitting in a seat where, you know what, at five, nine and a half or five ten, I can be one of those first receivers called come come draft day. All right. See, this is where I'm really glad you asked me to host the show when you did, because Santana is so gosh darn humble. I want to talk that shit for you for a second. I look at the draft class at wide receivers your year. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm old enough. I watched all these cats play, and even before them, I've been watching college football forever. David Terrell went eighth overall. Yeah. Corin Robinson went ninth. Rod Gardner <laughs> from Clemson went to the Skins, the pick before you. Santana Moss will not say it. I will gladly say it with my chest out. David Terrell, Corin Robinson, nor Rod Gardner could hold your jock. How does that happen? You know, like you hear so much leading up to the draft, man, it's so many different things or uh, reasons why teams are going to select guys in front of you. You know, one of the things you can always rest assured when it came down to those Miami guys, me or Reggie, we was going to pan out because we came up in a pro system. University of Miami groomed us to be pro athletes. Regardless of what position you played, it was a pro system. We had a pro head coach in Butch Davis. And regardless of what coach you probably brought in the door around those times, everybody panned out because the University of Miami history and, and, the, and our tradition was to groom those type of athletes, guys that's going to make it on this level as well as we did on the college level. Um, me and Reggie shared the ball, not with just these, each other, but with our tight ends, the running backs. So regardless of what numbers other guys put out, regardless of how tall they were, regardless of, you know, the competition level of who they played against, we was up there. <laughs> you know, we was up there. The only thing that you can probably put in front of us when it came down to um, singling us out as far as who should go whatever pick. A size, maybe? Size or what did they do at Combine or Pro Day. Oh, right. And when it came down to it, the only thing that hurt me was size because I right. outperformed right. Perform. everybody. Me and Reggie both outperformed everybody when it came Pro Days right. and Combines. What we did on our Pro Day was second to none. My 40, <sighs> my catches, my route running, everything they assigned us to do, it was second to none. And like I said before, what guys do in those months leading up to draft, we was doing from that first year we stepped on the University of Miami, you know, um, you know, campus. Right. We was being groomed to be pros. Well, hold on. I know you don't like doing this, but I, I we got to have it. Yeah. When Gardner goes a pick before you to the team that told you they were going to pick you, Tanner, you had to be pissed off. Not really, because honestly, I'm like that guy that don't know better. I don't know. I, and that's just why I never put my marbles into that basket saying this is where it's going to go. All I heard leading up to the draft, you never know what's going to happen. So just be ready for anything. Now, even when it came down to my agent, my agent told me this thing can go up or down. Right. Previously, before we even get to having those countdowns to where it's almost time for that to go on, 
I had front page from my local, you know, hometown team, the Miami Dolphins, that had just said it had never been a receiver at my statue picked high in the first round. So already the Dolphins threw a threw a um a log in the road for me to have to go over, go around, or try to go through to say, well, now you just put a wrench in everything that I had planned because now teams are going to take what you're saying and say that is true. You know what I mean? Why should we pick a guy at 5'9 slash 5'10 to be our go-to guy as a receiver in the, in the league at the point or, or time where most of the bigger receivers was being taken? Yeah, and but they picked at 26. Was that so you would drop? And it was all the reason because they wanted me. I was oh number one on their God. list. And they wanted to say, okay, we throw a monkey wrench into his whole thing. Maybe he falls to us. And it was crazy because my agent was flabbergasted by it. I was, like, looking at them like, damn, this is a team that my dad tried so hard for me to, you know, root for. And now look what they're doing to try to get me. I don't want to go to them anyway. So hopefully this thing can, you know, get – you know, handle, and my agent hollered at him, and then they said, oh, that was a mistake. We don't know who put it out. Back page news. <laughs> Five wow. days, six days later, next week news, they put in the back page, so that was a mistake by us. Because if you think about it, I think earlier, probably a year or two before that, it was a guy that came out from Louisiana Tech that um, that uh, played for the Pittsburgh Steelers mm-hmm. that caught crazy numbers that was a guy short my stature or sh- smaller that had been taken. And then you think about it, Peter Warwick, all those guys Peter had, Warwick was had been dog. taken. So, you know, it's a lot of guys that of my stature that had been taken in the first round, okay. and it was another um, team that's just trying to find a way to get me to fall in their lap. Okay, so then that brings us to the second pillar, which is how teams – I don't want to use the word sabotage because it's not always that. Yeah. They can sabotage you, so you drop. But they can also, which I think the casual fan sees more of, smoke screen and yeah. say, oh, we're not going to take that it's guy. A, it's a pretty good then strategy. It's all business. If you think about it. You can't sit here and get your mind wrapped around like, oh, this team is trying to screw things up for me. No, it's business because wow. at the end of the day, they know you're going to get drafted. You got to understand, these teams have what? Some of them have. Uh, a majority of picks, you know, um, from, you know, you, who, you, seven to nine picks. And you're trying to get top-tier talent the cheapest you can get it. You know what I mean? It's so much other things you have to go on when it comes to free agency, guys you want to pay on other teams, guys you're going to probably end up landing on your team for us who didn't get drafted. So if I'm a team, I'm a GM, or I'm an owner, I would try to go out to that talent and get them for cheap too. But – it's not always necessary to go out, go at it the way some teams do. And I think that, you know, in my case, when you look at the Miami Dolphins in 2001, the way they tried to handle things with me, you know, why try to, uh, you know, belittle me or lower what I've worked so hard Your value, for? You know right? what I mean? I yeah. worked so hard to get to where I'm at right now. I was privileged enough to not have to go out there and do anything other than what I did at my pro day right? and still put up the numbers or still put up the film for you guys to say, well, damn, you know, what he did every weekend is evident. He didn't come out here and and leave us with no thought in our mind that he couldn't go do that on the next level. Now, what I find it odd to, to sit in this seat and talk about now, because if you look now prior from 2001, Mm-hmm. It was a shoe in for guys my size after me and Steve Smith did what we did those years. Our first, you know, our rookie year, our rookie contracts. It was a shoe in. Smith went second round in your draft? Smith went second or third round. I'm not sure. Yeah, I got a um, list. I think it was third round. Damn, Steve Smith yeah, went, he went that third late? Round. He went third round. Oh, that's crazy, bro. But it was a shoe in because if you think the Dolphins end up getting a Ted Ginn, which probably was a little taller. But yeah. didn't have the kind of college career that I had. No, he didn't. You know what I'm saying? But he was known for his speed. He was known for his punt return ability, kick return ability. So every guy that came in after the 2001 draft mm-hmm. as a receiver or a specialist in that category of returning punts and kickoffs, they didn't care about the size no more because in that rookie under that rookie contract, those four, three to four years, guys like myself, Steve Smith. Steve Smith went to a Pro Bowl his first year of being a third-round pick off of just kick returns alone, you know, the things that he did. So, you know, I think us little guys kind of had put a stamp on the game and said, hey, man, you can't overlook, you know, the size factor of us coming in now. You can't you can't put that as a, uh, what you call it, as an asterisk by our name because of our height and say, right. well, they don't deserve to go higher because of their size because now we're showing you that we can do what we big guys ball. do, you know? Tana, that <laughs> – 
So I mentioned David Terrell before you, Corin Robinson before you, Rod Gardner before you. After you, Freddie Mitchell, remember mm-hmm. him? UCLA went to the Eagles. Reggie Wayne, your friend. We know the rest of that story. Quincy Morgan, I don't remember. Chad Johnson, of course, we all know Ocho. He went in the second round. Crazy. Uh, Robert Ferguson, don't remember him. Texas A&M. Chris Chambers, kind of remember. He went to the Dolphins. Steve Smith, third round, you're right. Went to Carolina. Snoop Menace. Now, Snoop Menace was really good at college, but never panned out Kansas City. He got hurt in Kansas City, yeah. It's crazy because situations pretty much handicap the player. You know, and me and Reggie talk about this so much. You know, Reggie was pissed off where he landed at. Because he dropped in the first round. And I don't think he dropped. I think he actually moved up because some teams had him going second round because of whatever. I don't know if it was because of me being the guy that they end up leaning on for the big plays. Yeah. But like I tell guys all the time, Reggie was our guy. Yeah, Reggie went 30th. In the, Reggie in was the first our round. guy. And Reggie had, you know, he had to have a knee surgery. Um, what is it? I think it was uh, late in our sophomore season. But bounced back off of that our junior year like nothing happened to him. And junior and our senior year. And so with all that said, sharing the ball with Reggie taught me a lot. And it actually mm-hmm. helped me be a great pro because you couldn't be selfish. Mm-hmm. I came into it not being selfish because I came from a place in Miami, in Carroll City, where, you know, Coach Walt Frazier didn't care who you were. He wasn't throwing you the ball unless he saw fit. And so – a lot of the times where guys land that, he's either going to help them mm-hmm. or he's either going to, you know, hide them from what their true potential so is. So while he be. was ticked off that he went so late, it was a perfect situation. Worked out for him. Because he worked got out with Peyton and it the worked rest out his history. Yeah, and, that's true. And like I said before, you know, who knows what would have happened with a David Terrell landing somewhere else other than Chicago. Right. Who knows? You know, I think Corin Robinson had a great spot. It's just things that he did off the field hurt him. Yeah. Uh, Rod Gardner. He was a great athlete. Rod Gardner reminds me of a guy who they, you know, Metcalf, you know, in the draft. Mm. You know, Rod Gardner has so much potential. Physical specimen. Who knows what would have happened if he goes somewhere else because he dealt with a lot of stuff that went on here in Washington that wasn't right. I end up having to have that same stuff that goes on in Washington, but just being the, you know, nature of the beast that I were, I dealt with it in college. I dealt with it in New York. So I was paying, you know, I was thinking I was built a little different to go out there and be able to handle it a little more. Hey, you got a different quarterback, I got to still go out there and do me. You know what I mean? So other guys are not always blessed to have that kind of mindset or ability to go out there and look over some of the stuff they got coming their way. You know what I mean? And that's why I say at the end of the day, guys like myself, Reggie Wayne, you know, we was built to be able to go out and perform on this level because we withstood all that, you know, through our college, you know, uh, careers. Fifth round, Redskins took Darnarian McCants in your draft. And then here's a name. My God. Seventh round pick, TJ Hushmanzada. You got to be kidding me. That guy had a great career. So, Tana, I want to go to the third pillar now. The agents. Yeah. You had the guy. You had Drew Rosenhaus. Drew Rosenhaus. But you were telling me there were a lot of guys, and, and there is every year, that can play yeah. and can certainly play in the league, but because of their representation, because of their agent, or lack thereof in terms of star power or big name power, they don't get a fair shake. That yeah. is so fascinating to me. If a guy can play, he can play. What the hell does an agent have to do with it's it? It's crazy because one of the things that Drew gave us insight on before I even you know signed Drew, Drew was like, you don't need me right now. Early up until the you know the time we had to work out and all that, mm-hmm. he always made himself you know present to know to my family like, hey, I want your son. I want to represent your son, but you don't need me right now. So take your time. And so, you know, me and my dad don't know the process, don't know what's going on, why he would say that. But this is Drew Rosenhaus. This is the, the guy. This is the guy. You know, it, amongst other guys, Lee Steinberg, sure. Colston Brothers, guys who was all, you know, courting me and wanting, you know, to be part in that uh, representation. Drew was like, hey, take your time. You don't need none of us right now because your son has set himself up to be a draft pick regardless and one of those first round draft picks because of his career. So <clears throat> we took that advice and kind of just say hey let me do let me knock down you know one you know um um 
uh, domino at a time. Let me go ahead and do what I have to do first. I went to the combine. I weighed in. I met, got measured. You, are you going to perform? No, I'm not going to perform. I'm going to wait till my pro day. And it was all the way up to my pro day that my dad was having interviews and stuff like that. So you're recording. Different agents were still in the picture. No everybody but... was in the picture. Everybody, that door was open huh. for everybody. And okay. my dad was sitting down with different folks. I remember that Super Bowl that year, um, the – Baltimore Ravens. Yeah, Baltimore this was, Ravens yeah. beat the, uh, the Giants, Giants yep. in the Super Bowl. Lee Steinberg at the time was trying to represent me and Reggie, and he flew us to Orlando and basically, you know, wanted to show us, you know, all the guys he represented, you mm-hmm. know, fun time in the Super Bowl. This has been our first time, you know, experiencing Super Bowl, you know, atmosphere and all that stuff. And I remember saying to myself, man, Lee Steinberg has a lot of guys that I would want to be, you know, on the team with. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It was almost like trying to find that next team you want to be a part of. And to tell you the truth, my dad didn't like Lee Steinberg, not because of who he was as a man or what. My dad just wanted when he talked to someone and when he interviewed him to that guy to – be a man and look at him eye to eye. Oh, he was. Oh, you did and, tell me this. He was like yeah. looking down the whole and time. And Lee Steinberg, he didn't have to give my dad no right. eye contact. However, he did things. He did them, but he didn't show my dad the uh, appreciation that uh, he wanted to see of him representing his the son. Respect, yeah. And my dad's like one of those guys. It, it reminds me of old Ti saying, you know, you don't have to like me, just disrespect me. Right. And at the end of the day, my dad was like, well, sh- clearly you like my son. Yeah. But show me the respect that you in here sitting with with me, his dad, to show me the same respect that you have of my son. Your dad took it as you to him would just be another athlete. Yeah, exactly. He wouldn't care. Another guy on your doggone list ah. of athletes that at the end of the day, wherever he lands, he lands. He right. wanted to see that agent that was going to say, hey, yeah, your son has set himself up well, but this is what I can do. Right. This is what I'm going to bring to the table. You know, and I, I think that's that. where Drew kind of fell into our lap because for day one, Prior to any time of me ever thinking about the NFL draft, Drew Rosenhaus said, one day I'm going to represent your son. Saw my, saw my dad one day, you know, uh, coming to a Kang practice, and he's like, hey, I like what your son doing. One day I'm going to represent him. My dad was like, you know, you know, being a Miami guy, hearing about Drew Rosenhaus, seeing him on the, uh, you know, he was always talking sports on Channel 7 at night, and we just sit there, and I'm like, man, my dad said, hey, man, you want <laughs> You know, Drew Rosenhaus saw me today, man. He spoke to me and said he loved what you're doing, and one day he can represent you. And to me, as a youngster in college, I'm like, I'm geeked about that. Wow. Because I know he has the best of the best. Sure. So I'm waiting for that day. Like, man, if he see it in me already, I know I'm on my way. So that only adds fuel to my, you know, fire to make me go out to continue to do what I'm doing That's cool. as a collegiate, you know, athlete. So all that behind me, and now we're interviewing these guys. And deep down inside, I want Drew Rosenhaus. That was your guy. I want Drew Rosenhaus, but I also like Lee Steinberg. Okay. And I like Lee Steinberg for so many you know, other reasons because the top-tier guys. You mm-hmm. know, I think at the time, uh, you know, uh, Edron had did some dealings with him. Edron didn't have an agent at the time, but Lee was the agent that sat down and talked with Edron's uh, lawyers. Mm-hmm. A lot of other guys. He had um, uh, Ricky Williams. I'm not sure if Peyton was other than that, but I know he had did some dealings with a lot of guys that – I was, you know, fans of. Mm-hmm. So when it, when it came time for us, I'm like, man, he want me in, Reggie. But this guy over here want me, you know. And when my dad sat down to talk with Drew, before he even got back to talk to me, he had already knew he wanted Drew. Wow. He wanted Drew. And Drew represented me well, not only from the advice he gave prior to leading up to things, but even after everything transpired with, you know, my pro day, Drew was the guy that was in the stance with my dad, even at the time not representing me. He wanted to sit side by side with my dad and say, hey, this is what he need to do next. This is what he shouldn't do. This is what he should do. And we took all that advice, and it actually got me to where I was at, to the point to where probably a week later my dad said, hey, you, who you like? I'm like, he like, I'm going to tell you who I do like and who I don't. And Drew was number one. He's like, I said, why? Wow. I said, why? Uh, and he said, well, you already know all the hoopla that goes on with Drew Rosenhaus. Everybody has to have – everybody seems to throw shade at him for whatever happened prior right. or previous in his career with you know with other athletes, especially from the Miami Hurricanes. He said, well, Drew was the first person that when he sat down, it was the first thing he put on the table. This is what people say about me. He dealt with a head on. This is, what they said I, this is what they said I did, allegedly did, and this is what happened. Here's the facts. Boom, 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 boom. Now – I'm going to tell you why I best, why I'm going to be best 
to represent your son. Wow. Because whatever they said I did, even if I did or not, these are the things I did do. The positive. And with this only, positive and the negative. Right. And the one negative, he was like, I can't go back that road because I've dealt with that already. I've been down that road, and it can lead to me not even having this no more. Mm. Took away all that. So he said, so at the end of the day, you know, I sued him best. One, because he already paid his way. He did what he had to do to be where he's at. What I come into the table is I'm going to be the guy that when a team tries to play yeah. with him like yeah. they did already with the Dolphins, I'm going to show the other teams why he's worth that pick and why you should take a chance on him and why even when he gets picked and when they try to play with his numbers, I'm going to show and prove to them why the guys in front of him and what they've done, why he should be in the same category of those guys and what he can be someday, you know, if they go ahead and bank that he's going to be that guy worth that number. So beyond all that he said, he did it. Real talk. <laughs> if it wasn't for Drew Rosenhaus, you would have never been a Redskin. Beyond all, Real and, talk. And, and that's the crazy part about it. So, you know, we talked about the kid Lindsey that yeah. was drafted. Oh, Philip Lindsey. A year ago, uh, he, he was a free agent pickup. Yeah. He didn't get drafted. He didn't get drafted at all. This guy was ranked ninth overall running backs his senior year at Colorado. Uh, 32 running backs was invited to the combine, and he wasn't one of them. How does <laughs> – I don't understand How's that. How does that happen? So, like he said before, he's done all the hard work. He don't need an agent to go to the combine. Somebody missed – somebody did something wrong. Uh. So he don't go to the combine. Then he goes to his pro day and run a 4 3 9. <laughs> then he runs great drills. Regardless of how tall he is, how big he is, he's doing all that he has to do doing to everything set right. the table up for itself. Now, when you do all that, now you need that representation to say, okay, regardless of what you've done, now he has to put that insurance in all those teams to say, hey, this is why this kid deserves to be on your team. Like Lindsey said, at least a seven-round pick, he felt that he should be. Mm -hmm. At least seven rounds. At least. All, and it was teams that had told him and had talked to him. Because draft that you're going to talk to teams. Talk, They're going to yeah. call and talk to your representation, find a way to get your – because they ask for your number during the combine and all that stuff. And they're going to talk, hey, have anybody given you a holler? Mm -hmm. And see, that's where agents come in hand at because it's up to your agent. If your agent sit there and say, nah, we're just waiting – then that team's going to wait because gonna that team's going to feel like, well, maybe we can wait to later to get this guy. That agent can drum up interest in you. The agent can play they behind like a damn puppet yeah. and say, yep. yeah, <laughs> regardless of what you think or what someone is trying to do, right. lowball him. Right. Oh, I'm on the phone right now. Hold on. Right. Let me holler at these guys. For example, with Denver. He ended yeah. up with Denver. Up with Denver. You could be like, hey, I'm on the phone with the Raiders right now. All yeah. of a sudden, Denver's interested. So the agent has it. a big role because – Regardless of how much you've done in your career to right. put yourself in a situation, there's guys that haven't done nothing. Deadly squad. There's guys, I, I, I tell you the truth, there's guys that do nothing in college and ran a great 40 and went first round. Good God. You know, the Raiders take a lot of those guys. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not it's trying true, to say, but it, it happened. I Facts. saw it, a kid from Maryland. I'm not going to say his name because, you know, that's not the type of stuff I like to do. A receiver from Maryland, and I'm pretty sure you being the guy that you I are, like to do it. You will, we will bring it up. <laughs> but that guy did nothing in no, college. No, he didn't. And he was a first round pick. So yeah. for a guy to do what he's done on the level that he's done it on and to go out there and show up on his pro day and did not get drafted, yeah. I find it odd. But that, then I think about it. That's where the agent comes That's in where the agent is. Oh, because I see. now he can be that guy, that spokesperson for you. Say, hey, are you forgetting what I have over here? Right. Are you forgetting what this guy has done in his tender in, you know, Colorado or wherever? Right. You know, and are you forgetting that, you know, if you take a chance on this guy, he can be that running back for you and do some of the same thing. So um, beyond all the stuff that I went through and, and the way I set myself up, I found it, you know, great to have a guy like Drew because Drew was – he was very handy when it came down to me getting picked at 16 because after going through what I went through with the Dolphins saying that maybe you shouldn't pick me high, I'm pretty sure teams took notice of that. And when it came time when Rod Gardner ended up getting picked in my mm. my selection that, 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 that supposedly I was supposed to go in, Drew was on the phone. And whatever team he was talking to, oh, oh if you don't take this guy now, oh, somebody else is going to get him. And I and I the Jets moved up to get me. <laughs> That's cool. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Drew Rosenhaus. We need you on the show. That'd be great. <laughs>
I went to 89 Ways to Give Golf Tournament hosted by my boy Santana Moss here. And uh, let's just say my game ain't up to par, Savage. But oh. but it was a beautiful event, though, Tan. I'm going to let you speak on nice it, man. Event. It was. Nice event. I still am shocked. You told me off air before we went on that that was the first one. First one from Tana, me. I've gone to countless golf tournaments, and that was so well done. I complimented Carmen to your manager. Mm-hmm. Um, it was so well done. I was shocked, shocked that this was the first one. I just can't believe it. It was so seasoned and put together and organized and awesome. You did a great job, man. I'm proud of you, bro. Yeah, credit to them people. I mean, you know, the ones you just spoke of, Steve, Carmen, Kate, um, they behind the scenes, they just make me look well, you know, made me look that much better. And it's funny because, um, like you said, you've been to countless, I've been to countless. I'm yes. going to one tomorrow morning, actually, out in uh, Delaware. And folks came up to me numerous times, like, Tanner, this is well put together. You can sign, you know, I'm I'm ready for next year already. You know, I'm, I'm signing up for next year. And that's what I wanted to give them. You know, anything I touch or anything I do, when my name behind it, I wanted to be almost like, you know what, man? I just, I just had a party. I, I, I just came from a party. I came from a good time. Whatever Tanner he's involved with, he's going to make sure that, you know, you, you, you have that warm feeling, like you know, you, you at home, and that's what I wanted. I wanted the music to be bumping early in the morning. I wanted, you know, we, we was blessed with some of the, um, you know, our first ladies, you know, Redskins first ladies, and you know, for them to come out and support me, they've been supporting me. I've been supporting them. It's great to just always have the people that matters the most behind you. And, you know, I credit a lot of those folks, those players that I play with, you know, with the skins and just the guys I played against. You name it. You saw Eddie Royal. You saw Plexico Burris. You had uh, Lee Evans. All these guys showed up, man, on my behalf and just, you know, gave everybody us, you know, uh, showed everybody else a good time. And that's that's that allows you to put on a good event you know having everybody up there for a great cause and i'm looking forward to next year but i know we have so much other things in store so i'm looking forward to that as well that's what i was going to say make sure you go to 89 ways to org uh for upcoming events because I, one thing about you and coach savage neither one of y'all sit still so i know <laughs> nah. if something else is in the pipeline i already know tan you gotta it's gotta hustle be. baby you know it but uh, i want to give a special shout out to some of my sponsors before we move on mm-hmm. um um, Adidas, you know, I, you got, I got to mention those guys. Um, Podcast Village, you know, yeah. the crib. That's yes. what we call the crib, man. Podcast Village was one of the big sponsors. Maryland Live, Bob and Maryland Live, Coca-Cola, uh, Panda Stonewall Energy Station, and Tito's. Hey, Tito's you can never was get enough of Tito's. Savage. Tito's was in the building. So guess who won? Who? Won the whole round. Remember the guys that was behind me, that they was yeah. waiting on me yeah. all the time? We was on a hole, and their ball was actually landing by us. And we sitting there like, Damn. Well, we either just that slow or that guy just he skyrocketed just nice. one. Yeah, and nice. so, you know, they took home the first place trophy. I actually got a chance to take home one because Fred Smoot didn't show up. But we understand, Smoot, you had work. So I took home Fred Smoot trophy. So Smoot, you know, even though you didn't show up, I'm going to take I'm going to keep it. I ain't letting you have it. I'm going to keep it since it's my first um, inaugural event. I'm going to go ahead and keep one of those first place trophies. I couldn't wait to see Smoot. I just wanted to ask him about his Game of Thrones because everyone, everyone <laughs> you know was complaining about it. I'm complaining. That so suck. Really? Man, Were you was, pissed off? I was, I'm beyond pissed. Damn. It's, it was whack this season. Man, I'm sitting here like we waited all these damn. They months. said they rushed it. You could it, tell. It, okay. But then they say they have something coming. They have a prequel. So they um, have they have a they have a whole season of how it started, how all these guys became who they are. You know what I mean? So. Right. I'm ready to see that. So hopefully, you know, that's better than what Sam, we saw. Did you watch last. that? I don't watch this. <laughs> me either. <laughs> I don't watch this. I ain't seen I respect Sam's it, out, though. Sam's out there blowing whistles at 8 o'clock I, at night, man. He ain't got no time to watch no whistle. shows. I don't even use no whistles. You don't need no whistle, huh? I <laughs> use me. Savage got his real life Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, running it. Yeah, I don't use no whistle. <laughs> that's what's up, man. Hey, look, watch that. We appreciate you coming in, man. I appreciate Family you having to the me, show. Man. We gonna have you back too, bro. Oh yeah, Cross I'll be a pleasure. Cross it. And matter of fact, I'm glad to be back on the Santana Moss Show podcast. I'm gonna go home and change some diapers. Peace. It's the Santana Moss Show. Home of the Blue Ball Dream. Number eighty nine. Hustle all the time. Travis on the right. Hot mic on the left. Every single week, it's a lyrical.